taken out in areas like utilities and consumer staples. So that that's the antithesis of what you would typically see rallying if it was on the basis of a pickup in economic growth. And then you also have the fact that there's been a low quality bias to a lot of what has been working, you know, retail favorites index, which includes the meme stocks, non-profitable areas, high volatility stocks, low, low, low ROE stocks. And our message has been take advantage of this being a, a healthier breadth rally, but to use trader lingo, kind of fade the low quality um, stuff that's been doing really well and lean in back into higher quality segments of the market. So be wary of, of the stocks that have because, you know, it's a big club of stocks that are more than 30 percent up from their June lows. Lizanne. <laughs> but but in terms of the ones that are, quote unquote, lower quality, get rid of those. But don't be afraid of those that have rallied more than 30 percent from lows, like an Apple, for instance, or, or mega cap tech. If they've got if they've got the fundamentals, I, I also think mm -hmm. we can't look even at the sector level monolithically. I think this is a factor driven environment. And I, I think you still want to emphasize, um, call it a quality oriented basket of factors like positive earnings revisions, better profitability, um, strong free cash flow, healthy balance sheet with high cash, low debt. I think that's a better way to approach the market in this kind of environment than trying to make a sector call or two. Uh, Chris, turning to uh, Treasuries, you think that the 10-year represents a market risk, actually, as it potentially rises with a less hawkish Fed. It's gained slightly, but still below 3%. Yield curve is still inverted. What do you think are some of the catalysts there? And uh, is it kind of portfolio rebalancing that could provide some headwinds for the equity markets? Oh, so, so there's a few things there. One thing I would say is that our trading range or the top end of our trading range is 42 to 4,300. We're there. The risk reward in near term looks lackluster. Um, well, we think things are okay, but we're not excited as we were a couple weeks ago. Get, getting back to the question about rates, you're seeing part of that today. What we've been saying is the cyclical part of the market, the value part of the market has really sold off, has really been beaten down. And we could see a bounce in that cyclicality as rates begin to increase. And, and the reason why rates could increase is, is the Fed is, is it's not pivoting, but it's decelerating, right? And so people will believe that the economy is coming back in. You heard the comments from Walmart. Things are okay. They're not terrible. They're not great. They're okay. And that could let the, the door back open for some of these cyclicals. The problem with the broader equity market is it's a growth market. And if rates go higher, one of the reasons why we were positive on growth is, is lower rates. That could cause some choppiness in the near term. So how are you recommending investors position, particularly um, with so many data sets due out ahead of the next Fed meeting? We've got Jackson Hole at the end of the month, Chris, so it could be very volatile. Yeah, let's say, as we talked about in the past, we think we're in a growth market. We'll continue to be in a growth market. We want people to buy growth at a reasonable price, not, not those high flyers you referenced before but growth at a reasonable price. You can find a lot of fall and growth stocks in and around, uh, I'd say, 14 to 20 times earnings, not revenue, but, but earnings. And, and that's where we place a lot of emphasis. And, and, and I would also echo, we do want to barbell that with some better balance sheets, with some lower risk. But at the end of the day, we're in a, we're in a growth market. We want those growth at the right price type stocks. And we think we'll continue to be in a growth market for some time. Lizanne, I want to ask you about uh, housing. Diana Olick had a piece yesterday in, uh, on CNBC.com talking about the potential housing recession. We saw starts declining 9.6% month over month in July, uh, declines in permits, real residential contraction, home builder sentiment in negative territory yesterday. Um, does that point to a further drag on GDP growth? Um, for the most part, uh, yes. I don't think it represents anything akin to what um, happened when we saw housing peak in 2006. So uh, I do think we have more rolling over to uh, to happen in housing broadly. And of course, housing is, is always local. So I don't think, uh, to use the word again, you can look at it monolithically. But I also don't think that we have an implosion coming because we didn't have the nefarious lending practices. There's not the alphabet soup of trillions of dollars of derivatives tied to the mortgage market 
infiltrating a massively over leveraged financial system. But you, you can still have prices that, that went way too high. And you're now seeing it in all of those metrics that you mentioned. And I think it's only now just starting to filter in to the good side of the economy. And a lot of those segments of the economy that the combination of the conditions supporting housing exacerbated in a positive way by the effects of the pandemic, I think that is very much in the rearview mirror. And I think the hits from housing, the ripple effects um, are, are not fully in the rearview mirror. I think there's some of that still ahead of us. Thanks to you both. Good to see you, Lizanne Saunders, Chris Harvey. Thanks. As we head to it, Quick for NDX Zoom losing about eight and a half percent on that downgrade we mentioned earlier. More on other another software name being downgraded is next. Stay with us.